All right, welcome in everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Fourth Space, welcome, bienvenue. Located on unceded indigenous lands in Jojage, Montreal, Concordia University's Fourth Space is activated on the daily via live events such as today's to create engagement around the various initiatives, dialogue, and research projects happening across the university. It is therefore our pleasure to collaborate with Amy Atkinson, PhD candidate at Concordia in Art Education, to welcome her and her invited guest, Nancy Long, for this live event podcast recording of Creative Tea, Conversations about the Making and Mentoring of Art. This event is the first in a series of conversations with art education scholars from Concordia, all about the art of learning, making, and teaching art. And we're very pleased to bring it to you live and in person on YouTube, and eventually as an edited podcast conversation. All right, if you're ready, Amy and Nancy, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks for joining us today. Hello. Thank you so much, Anna, and welcome everyone. This is Creativity, and this is a podcast all about the art of making, learning, and teaching art. Again, my name is Amy Atkinson, and I'm a doctoral candidate here at Concordia. I've been an artist and an art teacher for over 20 years, and I have found that I learned so many new ways of thinking and conceptualizing our world and inspiring myself by talking with creative people about their ideas. So I invite you to Join us today for a cup of tea as I talk with Nancy Long. We're going to delve into the making of art and the mentoring of artists, exploring how art is taught, how art is learned, and all that fun creative stuff in between. So Nancy is an artist and a visual art and media teacher within secondary education here in Montreal. Her path intersects with mine as she is also pursuing her doctorate in art education here at Concordia. In her artwork, Nancy examines the overlap of nostalgia and memory by reflecting how they interact with our senses. Her research focuses on engaging high school students to embrace process over product and welcoming mistakes in the art room as learning opportunities. Nancy has also recently steered her studio focus back to her first love of, of drawing. Sorry. So Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you for having me. Before we get started, because this is called Creativity, I have to ask you, what are you drinking? I am drinking some chamomile tea with a spot of honey, so to prove that we are really drinking. <laughs> uh, normally I don't drink, uh, I drink coffee in the morning, but because it's afternoon, it's tea time. Ah, okay, I was, I was wondering about that. So you're really a coffee drinker? Yeah. Okay. I'm drinking um, jasmine tea, which is my favorite. Um, but I do love the smell of coffee early in the morning. I used to work at Tim Hortons when I was in high school. So um, I just loved going into work to smell coffee. Okay, so to get started, tell me what you're up to. What are your research directions? What are you doing? So I recently finished my comprehensive exams uh, in art education. And um, so now I'm working towards the proposal for the big research project and um you know you're in the same position mm -hmm. it's a bit daunting but <laughs> it'll get done uh so essentially from my background as a high school art teacher some of the things that i've encountered in the art room are that students are really concerned uh, a lot of them with their grades right so it was a lot of questions uh, about is this good so it was a very broad question, and I was having a very hard time answering because it's so vague, and it's also not necessarily about what it is that they were doing, but the end result. So what I found is that in looking at the, the, the creative process of artists, we rarely see the artistic process itself. We, we, we can read about it after the fact, or in, in you know, some exhibitions will show the sketchbooks and whatnot, but it's very rare that you will show students in our classrooms, I'm talking about high school generally, um, the artistic process. And to show the students that the end product didn't just happen with a strike of you know, divine inspiration, it's laborious, there's errors involved, there's changing, changing of direction, excuse me, there's um, 
hurdles to go over. Sometimes it's a failure. Sometimes uh, it's just not working. Um, and that whole process, I find, is, is really where you do learn more. So why not look at the mistakes the students are making and turn those into learning opportunities? Um, but then it gets dicey because how do you grade something like that? So looking at various ways to help not just students, but teachers as well, to navigate these things. Because I find it's a skill to be able to be comfortable in this, these moments of ambiguity, in these moments of like, I don't know what I'm doing, to be okay with that, that's a skill that needs to be developed a little bit more. That's so interesting. So within your own personal creative practice, does this inform your research into this idea of ambiguity? Ambiguity? <laughs> I mean, it Thank you. It did it before because uh, I, I used to, the way I made art was very, very meticulous and very end driven, like end goal driven. I would see what I wanted to make in my head and I would work backwards from there. So it's very controlling. And it was like fairly recently I decided like this is not, I can't, I need to practice what I preach kind of thing. So I decided to challenge myself by trying uh, art forms and art materials that I've never used before to be able to take those creative risks, to put myself in positions of ambiguity and, and, and the unknown and not be worried about it. Um, because the way I made art in the past also like painting and drawing, it's, it's not hyper-realism, but there's certainly, like I would strive for this sort of you know, very 3D looking um, image. Whereas now I'm more, more I'm messier, like to, to be okay making a mess also is kind of sometimes problematic for teachers because of that control. Uh, that lack of control and the whatever 35 students you have to deal with. So I've decided to go back to drawing because I find that that's where I first sort of fell in love with art and to, to move away from realistic drawing and just do more experimental work. Um, I'm an artist like William Kentridge, South African artist who um, does a lot of animation with this process called destructive animation where he draws and erases so that the next frame isn't a brand new drawing, it's an erasure of the former drawing. And so you see the process as the film moves forward, you see the past marks that have been erased. It's really cool. And I find that to be okay with erasing your work, like that's, that's really difficult. And I, I, I found that uh, I've become a lot more brave, so to speak, uh, in, in being able to erase my past work. That's so interesting. So in your drawings, you do a drawing and then you erase it. And then what do you draw on top of it or? Yep, you draw directly on it. So okay. it's also environmentally you know, friendly because you're just using one sheet of paper. So you're drawing, I use uh, charcoal mostly because it's really easy to, to erase. Um, and it also leaves traces behind. Um, so yeah, you just draw and then whatever you're animating. So let's say if it's a person walking, you would draw the person standing and then you just erase the leg and move it forward exactly like you would in an animation with cells okay with many drawings only this way you draw on top and and you can see your past marks oh that's so fascinating and your paper holds up for this my what your paper holds up to all this erasing yeah because i put just on it oh, oh okay yeah, yeah, okay yeah. okay so you you mentioned kentridge who's a south african artist um mm -hmm. were there any my mic Sorry, is it too far away from my face? <laughs> okay. Can we fix that for you? Yes. Oh, <laughs> Hello. I, I apologize. I'm going to pinch your sweater. <laughs> Thanks. Better? Okay. Moment for technical. Oh, no. Did we, did, did we lose all of that? <laughs> no, I think we caught some. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about because you are an art teacher. So, yes. um, I'm, I'm trying to think back through your education and did you have any teachers that inspired you? I did. Um, my high school art teacher, um, she was just the coolest, the coolest. And we, I was in, I went to school in Ontario in Toronto and um, I remember her, she was older. And so, you know, teenagers may have the preconceived notion of what like an older person is capable of or that what they're, they're like. very cool. These are <laughs> preconceived notions of. <laughs> so she had her own ceramic practice. She, I think, she lived. I want to say on a farm or somewhere in rural Ontario, and she she introduced us to ceramics because we had a kiln at our school, and she was just funny. She used a lot of humor and in, in work, and she pushed me a lot to to 
like go beyond what I thought I could do. And um, um, I remember being able to, to take these risks in her class because she she was really pushing me to do it. And, and you know, a way that was very supportive. And also we had art, I want to say every day. I did. I had art every single day, which is very different than the way I have done it here in Quebec. Um, so that was a huge influence because we got to know each other very well. And we stayed in touch probably up until like first year university. And um, sadly, she passed away a few years ago. And uh, I remember hearing about it. And oh my gosh, I was devastated. <laughs> Even though we hadn't been in touch in 30 years or whatever, I was still very upset. So she made you feel really safe in your classroom. Absolutely, very safe. Like, the, you know, I was doing installation art as a high school kid and uh, in the 80s, you know, so. <laughs> wow. It was pretty special, yeah. That's really, that's really interesting that she would have such a strong impact on you till, till today. What else informs your work? Um, I'm really drawn to, so before I went back to drawing, I was really into um, installation and participatory installation particularly. So any piece of art where the audience is asked to somehow participate or be involved in, in it, so that when you, when you see it, it's one thing, but when you're involved, you know, pressing a button or pulling on something that the art has changed and it, the art exists in a new way because of the audience. So I'm really drawn to those things where you're involved in the space. I think that's a perfect segue to look at the artwork that you shared with yes. us. So part of the yes. podcast is our guest is going to share an artwork that is particularly inspirational or informative to their work. And so I'm just going to share um, the artwork that Nancy brought with her today. So just um, I'm loving this idea with having actually, actually drinking tea while we're doing this because it's very soothing. So this this is the work that Nancy shared today as being um, highly inspirational. Yes. So this is a piece uh, done in 2017 by Janet Cardiff and George Burrs Miller. I think that's how it's pronounced. Mr. Miller, if you're listening, apologies. Um, so they are a married couple as well as uh, art artist collaborators. They've been working together for a really, really long time. and. This was done, um, this, I, I saw this at the Musée d'Art Contemporain when they had their exhibition called, I think it was called There's a Crack in Everything. It was like an um, ode to Leonard Cohen. So what we're looking at is an organ that's been um, rigged up so that every time you press a key, it's a poem, a line from a Leonard Cohen poem writ, read by Leonard Cohen. So you're, you can compose your own brand new piece of poetry, or you can hit all the keys at once, and all these different um, lines from Leonard Cohen's poem come at you in these various speakers. Um, so different lines come from different keys, and they're also read to you from different speakers. So it's a very immersive experience, and you're, there's only one chair, so it's really one person at a time experiencing this in the space. Um, and there was a little spotlight and the rest of the room was dark. It was a really beautiful experience. This is so interesting. So this was, it was a gallery memorializing Leonard Cohen. So this was- It was a show where a bunch of artists, I guess, were asked to contribute something. I, I might be remembering the theme of the show wrong, but I, I recall having, there's, there were several artists like doing songs of Leonard Cohen's and this was also here. So the artists of this piece, Janet Cardiff and George Beers Miller. Okay. They're so Canadian. They are Canadian. Yes. yes. And they've been working together for a really long time. Yes. Like I think over 30 years. And they're, they are partners. They are partners in collaboration, artistic collaboration, as well as they're, they're married. Okay. And they work in this idea of soundscapes. Yes. They do a lot of soundscapes. They do a lot of immersive pieces. Um, they, they, they have another piece um, at the um, National Gallery in Ottawa where it's a bunch of speakers and you walk through the space and um, at different intervals there's sound coming, different voices coming at you and um, there's also, um, they work with touch sometimes. Um, it, it's just a, always something, something immersive and, and treating sound as if it's sculpture, as if it's a, it's a tangible thing. I love the setup that they've created. It's it's very interesting just from a visual perspective mm -hmm. because I, it looks like they're exploring ideas of of similar to you things of nostalgia and memory because yeah. they've kind of used speakers that are kind of 
classified as vintage now, I mm -hmm. guess, right? And then they have these two circular speakers, which are almost look like the top of like a gramophone. That is, that's exactly what it is. It's okay. a phonograph, phonograph okay. cone, I think it's called. Okay, so it's set up in almost a kind of um, like a, a like an assembly kind of um, amphitheater yeah, kind yeah, exactly, of setup. Yeah. So it's like a concert, and then you sit down and you play. And do we know what kind of piano that is? It's an organ. I don't know what kind. Okay. I don't know. And which is really which is really interesting to connect with Lauren, Leonard Cohen because he was a musician and he did play the piano within his concerts. So that's a really in. So you can almost envision. Um, this being in someone's basement or in someone's rec yeah. room and they're sitting down to play, perhaps Leonard sitting down, you know, to play as he writes his songs. And then, so every single note, like every single, like, key. yeah, no, yeah. every single key, every single key black that and you white. play is a different line from a poem. Leonard Cohen's poem. From one of poem. Leonard Cohen's poems, yeah. Interesting. So actually, this is really interesting because not only are you being in, engaged with Leonard Cohen's poems, but it's really an interesting discussion on the um, our technology and how it's advancing the, and, and your participation in this installation, because every person that sits down at that is going to create a different order, mm -hmm. right? So it's almost like you're going to be able to take Leonard Cohen's poems, but then rewrite them in your own creative way. Yeah, and I don't, there was no time limit when I was there because the, I guess the museum wasn't very busy. So I was sitting there a long time. Um, and so I was able to, you know, kind of remember, okay, this key is that line. So it would take a while to sort of create your own poem based on having to memorize where everything is. But uh, certainly, yes, you could do that. And can you play different keys at the same yes. time and kind of make a chord of sound? Yes, you can. So you can play all of them at once if you wanted to, but because they're coming at you from different angles, so all the noise sort of comes at you from different angles. Oh, so wait, so each speaker is one sound? I think I don't think there are enough speakers to match the amount of keys, so I don't think so. But I, I think like a few lines were coming out of each speaker, but they were coming from different directions. And are they in? Did Leonard Cohen record these? Is are they in yes. his voice? Yes. Oh, that's so. Yeah, interesting. no, no, it's great. It's great, and it, I was also drawn to it because you mentioned this basement vibe. Like it's got a '70s vibe to it. Yeah, with and the rug underneath. Yeah, so which again, like I'm very. <laughs> sometimes embarrassingly so very nostalgic person so that's another reason why i was really drawn to it is this sort of vintage look to it well it has really interesting links with actually leonard cohen's history because um he is from montreal mm -hmm. and uh he grew up in westmount i think and i don't know where he grew up but he had a house in the plateau for okay. years okay yeah he did uh, um but when he was younger he made his beginnings i guess um performing his poetry in jazz cafes around downtown Montreal. So it's got that kind of like cafe vibe, which is really, it's a really nice homage. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm going to stop the share um, and get back to our discussion. So um, this is the time in the podcast. This is my favorite part where it's time for the spilling of the tea. And this is where I give Nancy the proverbial microphone to share her own opinions or experience that she has learned or that she feels is valuable to share about her creative process, about art education, or whatever she feels is important for you to consider. So what I wanted to share is um, the importance of considering what our current school system is kind of doing to our, our youth. Um, Amy and I, are from um, went to high school in Ontario and so we come from a system where um, school subjects were semestered so at any given time I only had to juggle four subjects and then the next for for whatever six months or not, not even five months the next five months juggle a new four subjects whereas my students in Montreal and most schools in Montreal you're talking about nine to ten courses at once that's an insane amount of things to juggle um, and it's a lot of um, things to put on young people, not only in terms of school, but in terms of what they, else they're doing with, you know, extracurriculars, social media, you know, keeping up with their friends on social media, all that, all those pressures. I find it's exhausting and it's, it's really demanding. Um, I read a really staggering statistic. Um, it's an American statistic, but it's not so far off um, that 
something like 60, sorry, no, I wrote this down. 96, 96% of teenagers between the ages of 13 and 17 say that stress is their first or second major problem in their lives. Um, and they polled 900, they polled over a thousand students and 900 and something students responded. And of those 61% are saying that it's due to their grades. There's the stress, the pressure to get good grades. And so I found that tied really well into what I want to do in the art room to sort of mitigate those, those anxiety levels, to lower them, to be like, it's, it's okay to make a mistake, but it's, it's easier said than done, right? Saying it's okay to make a mistake to your student is very different than helping them live through, uh, develop those skills, as I said earlier, to, to make those mistakes and to be okay with making those mistakes. And so I find that any opportunity we can give to our students to, to take more time to do something is like gold. Time is gold. And it's really difficult when they're juggling nine or 10 subjects, when they only have art once in a while. Um, so I find it's a good place to start, I guess, in the art room, just to figure out to, with students and teachers, how do we give them that time? Because going back to the Cardiff piece, the Cardiff and Burrs Miller piece, one of the things that comes up in their interviews is um, Janet Cardiff talks about the gestation period of an idea, and she fully admits that taking, making a piece of art takes an incredibly long amount of time. So when we're asking our students to make something at a specific time and a specific day of the week and a specific, you know, hour in the day, it's, it's very difficult to generate very authentic things because they haven't had that gestation time, that time to really put something away in the back of their minds and just let it sit for a bit. Um, I mean, how do we do that in a system that is required to, to have marks and a report card and where teachers are bound to certain uh, codes of their own to produce marks? So this is sort of what I'm wrestling with, but this, this idea of putting all that stress, even more stress on the, on the youth is, um, it's a problem, it's a problem. Um, and I'm sure the pandemic didn't help that stress. So we need to figure out how to, how to minimize that and lower that level of stress. I think that's so interesting. And you brought up your, your high school experience because I always, I always joke with my students because when I went to high school, um, it was during a time that in Ontario as well, and it was during the time when OACs were required. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had to take six OACs for graduation, but my graduating courses are something that my students aren't given the opportunity to do. And that is my graduating courses were um, visual arts, English, um, creative writing, physical education. Um, and there was one about um, like family law and what was the last one? Philosophy. And so <laughs> when I tell my students that it's so un unrealistic in today's educational climate because um, students are required to take sciences and maths and um, English or different languages. So it's already already prescribed for them what they are able to take. And it's not just a blanket, you know, you have to take six courses of whatever you're passionate about. Yeah, so I was really lucky in that regards that I just took the courses that I really liked. Yeah, OACs. I was I went through them as well. Ontario Academic Credits. They yeah. don't have them anymore. But yeah, I remember I had yeah I had a phys ed in there. I had an art. I had yeah, all kinds of creative things for sure. Yeah, and imagine I took oh music. I took music too. Sorry, that's the one that I am. But I took that's like four creative courses and no science and no math. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with taking science and math if you want. If you want, right? Well, we did have to take math and science up until grade eleven, I remember, and then OAC, you could you could make a choice. Yeah, there's there's a, there's also the the pressure coming from external pressures on students, you know, is that the arts are maybe not the most viable in terms of future career, which is always problematic um, because there's lots of careers in the arts. Um, so you know, anything we can do to <laughs> promote the art and lower the stress is is great. 
let's let's revisit your childhood a little bit because I feel like that's <laughs> that's very okay. interesting because you're interested in nostalgia and memory. Yeah. So what were you like as a student in when you were a child? Um, I was a really good student. I really loved school, and like I said, I wasn't super stressed out about school because I didn't have that much to juggle. Um, sure, when exams came around, I was stressed like anyone else, but during the school year, school I I really enjoyed school. Um, so I, uh, one story that comes to mind in terms of what I'm talking about in terms of grades and making mistakes is in grade one. So I was six and uh, I can tell, I remember where I sat. I remember everything about that day. We were given a, a page, just a, a drawing, like a illustration to color. And um, I don't remember what the illustration was, but at the bottom there was a flower and I decided to color the flower in whatever color, but each petal was the same color. And I, I left one petal blank so that I could incorporate all the colors I had used in that picture into that one petal. So I made all these little dots. It's like pointillist petal, whereas all the other petals were whatever, pink or blue. Handed in, I'm like super proud of myself, like, oh, this is such a good idea. And then I get, it, I get the work back and it says nine on 10 and the petal is circled, like it was wrong <laughs> that I did this. And I just didn't understand. I didn't understand why it was wrong because there were no criteria, she just said, Color. And that petal probably took you longer and used different color, more colors than the other petals. <laughs> I just thought I was being really <laughs> creative. And in my mind, it wasn't taking a risk because of whatever, I was six and I was just like, oh, this could be cool, this could be fun. Um, it was playful, right? So that sense of play mm -hmm. comes in also to take in, in risk taking and, and, and um, not worrying so much about errors. But that stuck with me for years. So I can only imagine when when and, and it was almost like a measure of my worth at nine on ten right it's like wait a second so of course when you see this number on the paper um it's not it's not a measure of that child of that student but at the end of the day the report card is just a bunch of numbers and that's how they're measured right it's that performative aspect that is so prevalent in our school system particularly for students who want to go on after high school um, it's not a measure of who they are but that's how they are measured by that number. So I'm so curious, um, after you finished your high school, what made you, was there, was there somebody that inspired you that made you wanna to come to Concordia and to continue into art education or? or... I started in, in art history actually because of my art teacher in high school introduced us to architectural history and she just made buildings fascinating. I was like, oh, I think this is what I wanna study. So I came to Concordia to do art history and with a particular focus on architectural history. And there was um, a professor um, in art, the art history department at Concordia named Bob Gifford, Robert Gifford. Robert Gifford, if you're listening, <laughs> I love you. Maybe he's watching us on YouTube. <laughs> I don't know what happened to Bob. He doesn't work here anymore. Um, but I made a point of taking a class with him every semester because the passion that exuded from this man was just infectious. And in fact, he informed much of the traveling I did after, uh, after my, my first bachelor's. Um, I would go to these obscure little places in Europe to find this wacky church that Bob Gifford was so passionate about. He would sometimes hug the screen. He was so into it. I, I loved it. I loved it. Hug the image because of the image that yes. he was showing you yes. on the screen of a building. Of a building, yes. <laughs> So that's so interesting because we were just in New York at the NAEA, the National Arts Education um, Conference for Art Teachers, and Nancy has posted on her social media all these pictures of buildings. And I, and I mean, they're beautiful photos and they're really cool buildings, but I didn't, I didn't get the connection until just now that you said that you were so inspired by yeah, this professor. It's still, it's still in me for sure, even though I'm not studying that at all now. It definitely has made a massive impact on my aesthetic, for sure. Yeah. That, that teacher yeah and those courses and that it sounds like it was it wasn't the subject that he was teaching but more how he was able to translate how important and kind of how in love he was with this subject mm -hmm. that was infectious to you yes yeah and it i mean it, I, ta I learned so much and you know having him be so passionate and and uh leading me to go see these things led me to learn even more once you're there you know so yeah i'm very grateful to Professor Gifford. So while we were in New York, Nancy also pointed out this really interesting painting for me. Um, 
and I'm going to share it and I'm going to let Nancy explain um, explain what it is while I share it. So uh, can we see it? Is it? It's coming. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's coming slowly. Sorry. It's, do you want me to, it's the... Yes. So this is Napoleon's coronation, uh, I want to say 1804, I don't remember exactly, around there. 1805 to oh, 1807. Oh, oh. It took him two years to no, actually no, no. paint I mean, look at it. the so whole, it's, it's, it's very large. It's huge, it's humongous. So this painting is not in New York, but the reason I was talking to Amy about it was um, there was an exhibition in New York last week, it's still on, um, of Jacques-Louis David, the painter, the Jacques-Louis David's preliminary sketches. So I always love an opportunity to see the preliminary work, the process work, and particularly it's, this is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, so, you know, the fact that they're showcasing these preliminary sketches is great. So more of the people can see that, you know, this final result is not how the artist necessarily intended it at the beginning. There were changes along the way. So one of the things I found hilarious so just bear with me because I'm gonna I'm gonna is, stop the share and start the share again and again because it's a series of pictures I want to show you. <laughs> Keep going. This so is Napoleon, so interesting. In the painting, Napoleon is crowning himself the the emperor, um, and he's got his hands above his head. He's holding the crown. He's about to place it on his own head, holding the head, the crown with both hands. This is the final painting, but the preliminary sketches show a very different version, which I was really kind of stunned by um, because the the way he's holding the crown in the preliminary preliminary sketches is with what well, you can see here I'm about to share it you, he's holding it with one hand above his head and it's so bizarre and awkward at least for me I found this just weird the way he's holding it does not look regal it looks like some sort of buffoon about to tip his cap it's just weird and he did many versions of this one-handed crown placement um, until I don't know what made him change his mind. I haven't researched this. This all happened last week. But I want to know. He also made Napoleon. This is Napoleon with the the, with the laurel leaves. The laurel leaves yeah. on his head. Yeah. He made him look very young. Yeah, well, and tall. Probably because Napoleon <laughs> was a Which massive Which was not what he was known for. <laughs> Yeah, so I just so found it really interesting to see like the final result is like way more regal. So these preliminary sketches are just odd, right? And there's um, one more that I found right. that is actually with that that pose in the final. So this would be closer to him doing the, the final piece. This is a very well rendered sketch, almost almost perfect right so yes but he's, he's still in he's that still position that weird hello like it's just <laughs> strange to me so I want to know like did somebody come up to Debbie and say hey man this looks wacky or did Napoleon <laughs> himself say like I look ridiculous please make me look more regal like I want to know what made him change his mind but the point is like students don't get to see these things right? Yeah. they don't get we don't I mean maybe, I'm sure I'm sure there's teachers out there who do do this but generally speaking we show the students the final to get them to motivated to do X, Y, or Z. Or, so I, I've just found love the idea of being able to see the preliminary versions. Like Da Vinci has a bunch as well. But how uh, much work, like this is so interesting for students to kind of conceptualize. How much work did David put into this concept with Napoleon in this position? Because it wasn't just an early little sketch. This is a full finished, like, yeah. uber detailed yeah. like before the painting yeah hours days of his mm -hmm. of his work just finishing this painting and then being like oh no this person's not working at all let's do it again because the final painting it took him two years to create so this sketch alone would have taken him a, I don't know a long time <laughs> like I'm just <laughs> really looking at it going I would never finish this because <laughs> it's so detailed so I'm thinking it might take him like yeah, at least a few months, right, of, mm -hmm. of conceptualizing this idea, and then how he was able to pivot and and continue with his new one. I'm just mm -hmm. going to share mm -hmm. again one more time the final one, so everybody, um, everybody. And there are a lot of artists that actually choice. do show their process in their in their and are, they're very open about it, which is great. But um, uh, I'm I'm just talking about looking at names that students might know or paintings that students might recognize to show them that this wasn't like i said earlier divine inspiration this took 
a long time to plan, to sketch, to think about. Um, but I think of artists like um, Kara Walker, who we don't have up because I'm just thinking about it now, had an exhibition not that long ago where she put all of her sketches on display, all of her preliminary work was on display. So bringing students to see things like that too, I find really helps to, to minimize the, the gravity of a mistake because it's not, it's not a big deal, right? But this deficit model of like taking marks away when you make a mistake, that's kind of what they're, what they're living. Yeah, so, and so it makes the mistake have so much weight yeah. as opposed to just leaning into the learning and right. exploring the process. And, and, um, and even when, people, when students are finished, I find it's really interesting because sometimes they're not, they're not finished. You know what I mean? Like there's still time to refine and, and mm -hmm. rethink their ideas. So giving students that space is so encouraging for them as opposed to being like, oh, are you finished? That's an eight out of 10 kind of conversation. And I think it's, that's it's difficult too because some art classes are not every day and they only once a week. So it's very hard for the teacher to be able to give students that time. Um, because I, towards the end of when I was teaching, uh, I was giving students less and less homework because it's too much. There's just too much going on for them. And we don't know what's going on. So it, yes, they have nine or 10 classes, but we also, we don't know what's going on at home. We don't know their situation that could exacerbate the stress uh, on top of getting good grades. We were just talking about that earlier because even, even ourselves in our, in our education journey, we find that there's not enough moments in the day. And we are focused like blinders on our our one topic. So imagine having to juggle five different topics or not sorry, nine, nine or ten. Nine yeah. different <laughs> topics every night plus plus social media, which takes extra time. Right. And then your own hop like what if these students are also doing activities? Part time jobs. Part time jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever, taking care of siblings. Yeah. It's a lot to put on a kid. Yeah, it really is. This has been such a fascinating conversation, Nancy. Thank you so much. It's so interesting to take a take a moment and step back and really and really consider how how like the importance of time and what to do with the time we are given and how and how making mistakes is really like I, I'm just so inspired by David's work because I'm just like <laughs> yay. Like even he like he he creates these amazing masterpieces, but even he took like years to develop his idea. Like it's that gestation period that you were talking about, mm -hmm. and and that's not a failure. That's a journey of learning, right? And I think that's super interesting. Um, we do have a, f a few extra moments, so I was wondering. I'm just going to check and see if anyone has any questions. I'd like to open the floor. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, well, our we have a delightful audience member, thank you, is here as getting mic'd up. Oh, here we go. We're good. <laughs> you can use. No, 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 go ahead. Okay. Am I close enough? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Um, one of my questions is for Nancy. How do you see the arts making process connected with nostalgia and memory. How do I see the art making process connected with nostalgia and memory? Um, yeah, it's it's definitely linked, particularly when I this sort of new path I'm on in doing this animation where I erase because I can still see traces of the past, right? And the, the animation can't move forward without erasing the past, so to speak, but it's still there, right? So there's a wonderful word, um, it's a palimpsest. Uh, it's a, it refers to, um, I think originally it referred to writing that was still visible on top of, of writing, writing underneath writing, but it's very much um, uh, evident in William Kentridge's work and like that, that underneath that layer, Betty Goodwin too, a Canadian artist in her work and a lot of her work, you can see She's not erasing, but you can see traces of other drawings underneath drawings too. And I find something like that, like showing students something like that uh, is, is a really great way to get them to, to move away from this notion that things have to be perfect. Just like our memory is not, right? Our memory isn't linear. It's kind of all over the place, but we still get these 
the traces of the past that are so real to us and that we can connect to, even though they're not necessarily clear. Do you know what I mean? Next question. Thanks. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you so much. No problem. So as you were talking, I was thinking, you know what, that's so interesting. And, and finding that space in nostalgia and memory is actually a really fun exploration for students, especially since we were talking about they, they sometimes they may feel overloaded and they have so much work because I was just thinking like whenever I stop and take a moment and, and you know, remember some of those glowing sunshiny memories mm -hmm. of your past it's just it just kind of warms your soul kind of thing so mm -hmm. so exploring that with students and getting them to tap into their memories of childhood and their happy memories um would be a really interesting exploration for them to kind of i did it once with my students but you have to be careful right because you can always trigger some not so great memories True. as well but i did it using um candy <laughs> <laughs> always a good memory that, that's a good prompt i did it using candy i i got a bunch of jelly beans those those jelly beans that come in not the old jelly beans but the newer ones that come in all, all the different of, flavors yeah like whatever peach and watermelon and all these flavors so i got garbage student, <laughs> fish no, that's the birdie bots Harry oh, Potter ones. okay no, 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 no not stay those. away from those <laughs> <laughs> i got them to eat a jelly bean they had three jelly beans in front of them randomly chosen and they had to close their eyes and eat one and then write down point form like a stream of consciousness what it reminded them of and they did it for the second and for the third and then from there they chose one that they connected with most and then i made them do um like a surrealist watercolor based on that memory and the different images that popped up because as i mentioned earlier like our memories don't come in a linear it's not you know beginning middle end it kind of comes at you in waves whoops sorry it comes at you in waves and so i had them do this sort of abstract like surrealist where it it's like a real looking thing but but configured in a very surreal way just like your memory um it was very successful uh i found that i i was able to challenge them using watercolor too so doing a project that they were really really into with a difficult technique i found married the two really really well well that just sounds so fun to me right now like just eating jelly jelly beans and then thinking like wow that's really that's really a cool idea and it fits as you were talking i'm like that fits really well into the installation you showed us because sitting at that piano and playing you know keys that tell like that you hear leonard cohen saying a poem also would trigger memories mm -hmm. because sound and taste are different senses that we can kind of tap into those memories mm -hmm. and and bring us back to different spaces where we used to be and also he had uh, he had died at that point i think he died in 2016 and so it was again hearing his voice brought me a sense of nostalgia not just not just because of his voice and and the setup of the 70s looking situation but also i listened to a lot of leonard cohen in my first first and second year university yeah. so again that, that transported me back <laughs> it's so powerful just connecting with those different senses in your art making is so is so interesting and powerful so having something to drink here is uh makes right? it all, ties it it's all like together <laughs> so thank you so much for for coming and talking with us today i have learned so much um i want to know is there any way that our listeners can learn more about you uh no <laughs> <laughs> i am the worst at promoting myself all my social media is private just for my friends so i don't have a website i don't i'm like no <laughs> i'm sorry i have an email which i can share if you have any questions or uh, want to know anything specific um it's nancy.long at concordia.ca okay and I, i'll post that later i'm going to post the pictures as well so everyone can see um but is there anything exciting coming up for you in your yes I am very, very excited to tell you that I am going to Iceland for a month in wow. June. Yes, I've saved three of my credits from my doctorate um, for something very, very special. I didn't know what at the time, um, but this came along and uh, I was accepted to go. And I'm Is this be... the experiential learning project with Dr. Kathleen it's, Vaughn? It is. It's with Dr. Okay. Kathleen Vaughn. It's the field school in Iceland um, for all of June, and we get to make art and learn about textiles and, the, and you know, hang out with some sheep, uh, just sit on so the edge just, of the water. So you're just going as like an art practice? 
You're gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do um, a research creation probably and some, some writing and um, mostly sort of exploring. Uh, we had to propose different things we might wanna do with our art. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna see what direction it takes me. Uh, I'm very excited to just be making art all day. It's have you been great. to Iceland before? I have not. Oh, how fascinating. I know, and the sun doesn't really set in June, I'm told. Oh, so it's right. uh, light all day and yeah, just to be, I mean, I'll miss my family very much, obviously, but it, it's, it's exciting to me to be able to make art for an entire month. Do you have a plan on how you're going to sleep when it's day the whole time? Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's all I worry I, about. How I are you going to get your sleep in? <laughs> I wear a mask, but uh, I'm, I tend to stay up really, really late. Um, and so I'm hoping that <laughs> eventually I will sleep. Okay, uh, but yeah, no, it should be really fun. And uh, there's other, there's 15 other people going who I, I don't know. I only know one other person, so it'll be really exciting to meet new people in this circumstance and just to get to learn a bunch of new stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited to talk to you about it yeah. after you when you come back to hear your adventures. Well, thank you so much, and thank you, my friends, for spending your time with us today. Um, exploring some considerations that may inform you about the fascinating world of art education. Perhaps we inspired you today to look at art through an alternative lens. Um, you can find my artworks that we talked about today on my Instagram, Miss A underscore art class, and this episode will be posted to the Fourth Space is the Fourth Spaces YouTube channel. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, Amy and Nancy. So great to have you in the space and joining us in this way. I hope that tea is still delicious and not too cold it now. Is. Thank you. <laughs> okay, awesome. And I'll just I give a quick shout out to the audience members who joined us via Zoom and in the space to listen to this uh, exchange. Was, I hope you all enjoyed yourselves. And as Amy suggested, we will be carefully gently and lovingly editing this conversation and re-releasing it across our channels, uh, Concordia University for Space on SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, folks, we'll wrap it up and wish you a great afternoon. Until next time, creative tea. Bye. <laughs>